Good morning. Uh, we are going to be in Psalm 132 today. Uh, this is a psalm that we're not sure exactly who wrote it. Uh, while there are some who wonder if David or Solomon wrote it, uh, many believe this psalm was written by Jews returning from exile who were reflecting on the Lord's promises in their past and considering the application of those promises to their own future. This psalm progresses through the Lord's promises to David and sees their ultimate fulfillment in the Anointed One who will reign forever and ever. So this is another messianic psalm looking forward uh, to the Messiah and his ultimate kingdom and reign. This psalm is undoubtedly focused initially here, though, on the promises and oaths related to the temple, meaning uh, this psalm would have also been sung by the people as they went up to the temple mount to worship the Lord. In fact, there are many similarities between the first half of this psalm and, and a psalm that Solomon wrote for the dedication of the temple. So that's why, likewise here, we think this was written by those returning exiles as they were building that second temple. And so they wrote a psalm, much like the one Solomon had written for the first, looking back and looking forward as the Lord calls them to worship in this new place. So let's read here Psalm 132, verses 1 through 18. O Lord, Remember David and all the hardships he endured. He swore an oath to the Lord and made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids, till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. For the sake of David, your servant, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath that he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor will I satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David, and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but the crown on his head will be resplendent. Let's pray and thank God for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that your word not only calls us to remember all that you have said and done in the past, but calls us to look forward to the fulfillment of your promises, of the incredible oaths you have made on the basis of your great name, your great power, and your purposes and will. Lord, I pray today that we would take you at your word, that we would trust your promises and depend upon what you have said, that our hearts and minds would look forward to all that you have called us to, that we would eagerly look forward to the day when we live in the glory of your kingdom forever. Remind us what we live for. Remind us where we truly belong and where our real home ultimately is. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So this psalm begins with the people of Israel essentially asking the Lord to remember David. They're calling him to remember David because they want the Lord to remember the covenant agreements that he has made with David. You know, David's oaths to serve the Lord and to ensure that a house and a temple would be built for the Lord in Jerusalem were things that David had said, God, this, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to make happen. 
And the Lord had responded in various ways and in various promises, specifically, though, regarding one of David's descendants who was yet to come. And the psalm here expresses that David recognized that he had built himself a pretty grand palace there in Jerusalem. But how could he sleep there each night in peace, knowing that the Ark of the Covenant the visible representation and reminders of both God's promises and laws to Israel, as well as God's presence with them, was being moved around from place to place, neglected and overlooked during David's life. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant uh, was that wooden box uh, covered in gold in which uh, the Ten Commandments set uh, a, a jar of manna, uh, as well as Aaron's staff that had budded. Uh, and this ark was often called the, the, the mercy seat. It was the place where the high priest would sprinkle blood uh, on the day of atonement. It was the most visible reminder of God's presence and promises to his people. You know, originally it had set in the tabernacle, but the Philistines had destroyed the tabernacle uh, in the days of Eli the priest and, and, and the early days of Samuel as judge and prophet. And here in verse 6, where scripture says, We heard it in Ephrathah, we came upon it in the fields of Jar. These were two of the key places where the ark had been moved around to before it was finally brought by David to Jerusalem. And the verses that follow represent a call to the people and to the Lord to be present at the temple so that the priest of the Lord might be made righteous and that the saints, meaning simply those dedicated or set apart unto the Lord, might truly and finally sing there for joy and praise and worship. So the first half of this psalm, these first nine verses here, had a very important and practical meaning for the people of Israel in their day. Um, especially there in those days after the exile where they had this new temple and they desired to dedicate it to the Lord and truly make it the place of worship that God had called them to make it be. And so this is truly a, a psalm of ascent, a call to worship, uh, the kind of psalm that would have been sung as the people came together for worship, either uh, on a particular day, uh, such as a feast day, or just in general as the Levites would, would enter into the temple in the morning to begin that day's tasks of service and worship. This psalm really calls the people to remember the faithfulness of the Lord to everything he has said. The Lord had blessed both David and his son Solomon. The temple was now built, the ark was ultimately placed within it, and the Lord in a very special way had revealed his presence there in the past amongst his people. Thus those coming to the temple now weren't just coming to worship another local idol like many of their ancestors had done, but they were coming to worship a personal God who had made a real covenant with them, who had made real oaths to them as a people, and who was personally present before them. You know, it's, it's one thing for someone to say, check the score to a, a game. It's another thing to be a part of the team that is actually in that game. And sometimes I wonder if, well, if as Christians today, we sometimes just come to church to check the score, to see how God is doing. Maybe learn something new and just go home a, a happy fan of the winning team. But you see, when you're actually a part of the team, when you're actually a member of that group that is actually engaged in the conflict and the purpose, then everything matters. Everything you do during the week, as well as the time when everyone comes together for, well, for the sake of the illustration, game day, it all matters because there's something bigger at play there that you are personally invested in and a part of. You know, as Christians, we are not simply called to be fans of God. We're part of his team, a part of his family, a part of his kingdom. We belong to him, and we have a place with him forever. Thus, when we come to worship together, we're coming to worship in his presence for the sake of his purposes on the basis of his promises. 
and realize we're we're personally invested in all of those things. Our our hope and being comes entirely back to God and all that He has laid out for us, and and His presence with us is the entire basis upon which we live our lives day in and day out. Our hope, our identity, our being, our future, and our home is entirely wrapped up in God and His promises to us. And so when the Israelites here came to worship God at His temple, they came as a people bearing the name of the Lord. They had multiple personal covenants with God, first through Abraham, then Moses, and now David. And as those who belong to the Lord, whose futures as individuals and as a nation came back entirely to God's promises, they had a very real personal investment in what God had said, in the oaths that God had made to them and their descendants. So this psalm called them not only to reflect on the promises to David, which the Lord had already fulfilled, but also consider the promises of the Lord, whose fulfillment still lay ahead of them. And of course, the central promise of the Lord to David was that of the Anointed One, that of the Messiah, the Christ. And the psalmist recalls the Lord's promise to David in verses 11 and 12, where it says, One of your descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. So God's faithfulness to this oath, to this promise, that one will reign on the throne forever and ever, is truly unconditional on his end. However, the participation in this promise by David's descendants could be forfeited by their disobedience. And ultimately, many of David's descendants did indeed turn away from the Lord, ignoring the Lord's covenant and turning to idolatry. As such, there was a very long period of time in which no one reigned on David's throne as the rightful king of Israel. And for those who especially see the psalm as being written or sung in the days of the exile, then those who wrote this knew full well that no man was reigning as king of Israel. And they longed for the day when that would change, when the anointed one, when the Messiah, would come and rightfully reign over all of God's people forever. And beginning in verse 13, 13 the psalm uh, records the Lord's response to the people's cry for the anointed one to come and reign. Scripture says, you know, that the Lord personally has chosen Zion and will personally reign there enthroned forever and ever. Uh, Zion can be a reference to uh, the physical hill there still in Jerusalem uh, where the temple sat and uh, arguably will sit again here. Um, Zion can also point to the future and the new Jerusalem and the eternal home of all those who belong to God. But for those, of course, who first wrote this and sang this, they were likely thinking about that hill right there where they had gathered to worship. And so these people here have asked for a king, for a Messiah to come, to reign there at where this temple stood. And the Lord responds by saying, yes, you know, don't worry, I have chosen personally to be your king. I will be the one who will meet all of your needs, God says. I will clothe uh, your priest with salvation, and the saints will sing for joy. You know, the people have prayed for an anointed king to rule in Jerusalem, and the Lord essentially says here, I have something even better in store for you. Me, God says, I will come and reign, and here is what I will do for you. So Zion here uh, is in a sense here, a reference to both, the literal Jerusalem where they stood and the new Jerusalem where we will spend forever with our God. It's a picture, uh, many believe, of the millennial kingdom, but also the eternal kingdom. It's just that picture of the Messiah ruling and reigning. And here it's important, God doesn't just say that the priest at that time will be clothed with righteousness, meaning right actions and right things. They will be clothed with salvation meaning their sins will be addressed in full and won't be in the picture. And all those who belong to the Lord, the saints, will most certainly sing for joy as the Lord meets all of their needs. So how can this be? How will the Lord accomplish this and do this? 
for Jew and Gentile alike have sinned against the Lord, and in so doing have separated themselves from the Lord unto death. But the answer is given in a picture in verses 17 and 18. There where it talks about this horn. And a horn is a symbol of strength and a symbol of kingship. And it says here that the Lord is going to grow this horn, this king, for David. Implication being, David can't do it. David and his DNA and his descendants cannot grow the horn, the strength, the king needed to rule and reign like this. David's descendants had failed just as he did to, want to honor the Lord in all things. So the Lord is saying here, I'm going to personally intervene and I am going to be the source of life for this king that you need. And multiple times the Lord had personally promised David that he would establish a lamp in Jerusalem, a light. And now the Lord is connecting this prophetic promise of a lamp, this light, with a Messiah king who will be a descendant of David, but yet one who will be grown, who will be made personally by the Lord. And it adds here that the enemies of this king will be forever clothed in their shame, meaning that the enemies of this king, their sin, will come to define them forever, whereas the glory of this king will be resplendent, or more simply, it will shine and flourish forever. It will never cease to lose its value. The glory of this king will never end, never fall short, never be reduced. And you know, this is where as Christians today, it is so important for us to not only look backwards to the cross and the empty tomb, just as the Jews look back to David and God's promises to David, but that we look also very carefully and eagerly to our Lord's second coming and the eternal kingdom that God has promised to us. You know, the coming of Christ into this world some 2,000 years ago, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection were but the first steps in establishing the kingdom of God in all of its fullness amongst his people. You see, the Lord didn't just promise to make a way for sins to be forgiven. He promised to redeem us in full, that we would be saints, people set apart unto him, a holy people that are priests, priests with salvation in his everlasting kingdom. That he would not only pay the debts of our sin, but supply us with our very life and joy forever, meeting every single need we could possibly have. This is the hope of our salvation, the hope of the cross and the empty tomb. We cannot disconnect uh, the cross and the empty tomb from the eternal kingdom. You see, there are actually more Old Testament prophecies focused on the eternal kingdom than on the cross. And if you remember, Jesus, when he came and began his ministry uh, with his disciples, Scripture says he was proclaiming, he was preaching the kingdom of God. And that is exactly what his disciples did as well when they began their ministry. The good news, the gospel, is the gospel of the kingdom of God. All of this, all that God has done in his promises in the past to Abraham, Moses, and David, his work through the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, Jesus' actual coming, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, even his ascension, all of this culminates in the kingdom of the Messiah that will never end. The cross, as 100% awesome and crucial and essential and important as it is, is not the culmination. Neither is the empty tomb. The culmination of all that God has promised and done is that eternal kingdom where our Lord will rule and reign and we will rule and reign with him. That is the place where we belong. That is the place unto which we have been saved. The purpose of all of this is that coming kingdom. You know, sometimes I wonder if we are sort of selling God and his promises a little too short. Not truly recognizing the full value of what the Lord has set before us. 
You know, I think there are many today who never get past the manger and that picture of baby Jesus. Many more who never get past the cross and the incredible payment there and the debt that our Lord addressed, the wrath that our Savior faced for us. And it seems there, that there are even fewer who truly live each and every day in light of the coming kingdom of God. Church, you have been redeemed for an eternal purpose, an eternal home, that you might serve and honor the eternal Lord and King. His promised kingdom shouldn't just be something we refer to when we decide to examine the book of Revelation. His promised kingdom should define every bit of our lives and worship now. Because we have not been saved by a God who is far off. We have not been saved just so that we can get through this life in the way this, that we might prefer to do so. But we've been saved by a God who has personally come to us, who has personally died for us, and who has personally gone to prepare a place for us. And that place is where we're headed. That place is what we're living for and looking forward to as we serve the Lord, worship Him, and proclaim the good news of that place, of that kingdom, where our Lord will reign forever. See, church, we cannot afford to just be fans of God excited about the cross and the resurrection and what he's doing, but not really living for the purposes of all of that. It's one thing to show up, say, to church week in and week out and acknowledge God. It's another thing to realize we live every day here for our true home that is coming. To remember that our Lord's first coming was just that first step that culminates in his return, in his second coming, which is growing nearer and nearer by the day and by the hour. We worship today because we will worship there forever. We serve today because we will serve there in his presence forever. We humble ourselves now because we will be lifted up there in his presence for the sake of his great name. Are you truly living for your eternal home? Are you truly living for the glory of his kingdom? His kingdom which will never end. Remember the oaths that God has made to us, the promises he has set before us. And let us not live for anything less than that which God has set before us. Let's pray. Lord, Thank you for the incredible promises you have made to us. The oaths that you have made based on who you are, what you have said, what you have done, and what you will do. Lord, as we reflect upon the salvation you have brought to us, the death you died for us, your victory over the grave, may we be especially mindful today of why you died, of why you rose again, why we have been given salvation, been given your spirit, a new heart and a new life. Do not allow us to live for anything less than the glory of your kingdom. Grant us your perspective this day. Grant us your joy in our worship. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Go in the grace of and peace of Christ, and live for his kingdom this week.